Thank you, Jethro and Bethany leading this hymn this morning. God is love. He is Lord and He is love. Good morning, CABC. How are you? Say hello to the person next to you. God loves you. And also tell them He is Lord, your Lord. Amen. Don't you guys love to eat? Don't you guys love to eat? Come on. I think, I think this is universal, not only Chinese or Asians. Everybody loves to eat. But today we're going to talk about you know, a subject on eating. The scripture we just read this morning, Paul opened up in Romans 14. The thing is like, what should you eat? What shouldn't you eat? Don't pass judgment on each other. So let's come to the Lord, you know, before we expound this passage here this morning. Father, be with us this morning as we expound the four verses. May our heart be right with you and we're right, my brothers. And for your good, you already accepted us as your children. In Jesus' name, we ask and pray. Amen. Actually, I have another title. You know, I gave the title that do not pass judgment to one another, which is direct quote from the Bible. But I would like to also address an issue here this morning, as Paul say, says uh, in chapter 14, 1, he said, as for the weak, there are some weaker believers, weak believers, and some strong believers. You believe it? There are some weak believers. Well, we're not looking down on them, by the way. Right? We're going to find out. But there are some weaks. And Romans 14, 1 opens up, and said this, as for the one who is what? Weak in faith. Welcome him, but not to quarrel over together. Opinion. And some say undisputable, undisputable things. What are those things? What are the opinion? What are the undisputable things? We're going to look into it. All right? We're going to concentrate only for four verses this morning. We're not going to go through the whole 11 verses. But in 14 chapter of Romans, there are three things Paul is just addressing to us. First of all is what to eat, what not to eat, how do we converse with people that observe one way or the other. The second thing that Paul is talking about in chapter 14 is to observe certain dates. Should we celebrate or should we not celebrate? I'll give you a you know, very cultural thing. Most, most of you come from Far East Asia, right? How many of you, you know, eat mooncake? Have you eat mooncake? Right? E even mooncake in the Philippines, right? Right? Mooncake festival. Well, there's a tradition, but some believe not. This is unbiblical. You got the picture here? To observe the mooncake festival or not. Jew, Judaizers, you know, the Pharisees have the same thing. Jewish tradition, to observe the not observe. The third thing, wine. Should Christians drink wine? Some said, no way. You know, you get drunk, you do this, this, that. Who tell you to get drunk? The Bible said, do not get drunk, but be filled with the Spirit. But can Christians drink wine? We're not going to discuss that today, right? I don't want you to row up and come up to me and say, Tim, Pastor Tim, you said, I cannot drink wine. You said, or well, you can drink wine? I go to another church that's abstain in wine. There are Christians like that too. So Paul is telling us, as for the one who is weak in faith. What is weak in faith actually translate to? Okay, we're going to look into it a little bit. And also welcome them. Do not quarrel over what I said, opinion. I just give you an example of opinion. Right? You want to drink wine, what not to drink wine, that's your opinion. So let's take a look. What's faith is? There's two types of definition in faith, actually. One is objective faith. It's the Christian doctrine we're referring to. The doctrine is cannot move. It is defined with God, who God is. The attribute of God, God tells us this is what you should do, shouldn't do. Right? For example, stealing. Right? We shouldn't, thou shall not steal. Thou shall not cover. And look at, you know, something that you want. From your neighbor's house, I admire it. I want that too. That's not good. Or you look at lust, right? Lustful 
and that's not good. That is set in stone. You cannot compromise in those fundamental doctrines that sets in the Bible. That's because who God is. He is holy and he is just. Those are objective faith. You look at it, you can't change anything to do, but you accept it. But the other one is subjective faith, meaning it's like your faith is based on your perspectives. How do you perceive and how your experience with that particular circumstances or item or things? Then you form your opinion on certain matter through the lens of your eyes. Those will cause subjective faith. It's important first we realize that faith has two sides of it. One is unnegotiable. Another one is doesn't really matter. Non, is, is non-issue. And Paul is talking about here in chapter 14 is that the church is a Rome's are fighting over a non-issue type of opinion. I, listen, I like hamburger. Summertime, I like to grill a hamburger because I think it's delicious. And some like steak. But I know some people are vegetarian. They say, look, you know what? I, I stay away from those. But how dare you eat meat? You know, and, and putting a curse or like some kind of, some kind of a judgment on you. Paul said, don't do that. Don't do that. That's because you think it's good for you, not good for other people. You putting your conviction on other people. That's only your conviction, your opinion only. So speaking of that, why do we have a, such a, diverse opinion in the church of Rome or, or, or you know, the, the, uh, the early Christian churches. <clears throat> it's because we have different depth understanding the scripture. Understanding what you can do, can do. You don't think this happens still today in the 21st century? What happened 2,000 some years ago still happened today. And we experience every day the church even here in CABC. All right, let me get to it in the point here. So first understand, Paul is talking about the faith. Now, this faith is not putting our trust in God, that faith. Rather, the faith is our action, our everyday living through, experiencing God, that kind of faith, the grace faith. Yeah? Because this faith doesn't have a definite article before the word faith, right? I'll give you an example. Definitely article, you know, is like the faith, the faith, right? And in Jude, uh, the only chapter, well, no chapter three, right? <laughs> chapter <laughs> of third verse of Jude. What it says is that, dear friends, he said, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share. I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for what? The faith with a definite article right here, right? And this is objective faith. The truth, the faith, the truth. We mean God himself. That was one of what entrusted God's holy people. You see that difference, right? Okay. So let's just go down to 14, 1 to 4. What is the issues? What is the issue? What is the issue here? The issue because we first understand Paul wrote to the church of Romans in Rome because there are two types of people. We remember the church gathered uh, Jews, bel Jewish believers, which their background is Jewish background. Right? They go to synagogue, they observe all the laws and so on and so forth. They understand, you know, from Leviticus 11, you know, the, uh, 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 it was written for them what to eat, what you permitted, not permitted to eat. They have the tradition. And they're not like a blank piece of paper walking into the church today. But they understand God, I want to worship God. This is the way that I worship. It's by observing certain rules and laws. But another side of the coin is that there are believers, the Gentiles, not Jews. They heard the gospel of Jesus, they died for them. And Paul understand what they've gone through here. They're totally pagan. 
they don't have any Jewish tradition or religions upbringing. It's like a blank sheet of paper. So they come in here, they say, look, you know what? Now I become a Christian. Thank God my life's changed now. Like, you know, chapter 12 of Romans, I am now being transformed into Christ's likeness. But yet, I don't have a background that I, just like, you know, the, the Jewish brothers, that they, they have that religious upbringing. So this is two very different group of people. Now, that's a backdrop, the setting. I want you to know. So with that said, because of cultural, religious upbringing differences that caused some disagreement. And basically, it's opinion. And some people said, well, I am a vegetarian. I don't touch meat because meat is unclean, especially a certain type of meat. But to the Gentiles, no big deal. I can eat anything because God created it you know, for my consumption. I can eat meat, I can eat beef, I can eat pork, and things, things, things that, oh, God forbid, you know, pork's unclean. So that there's some disagreement right there. We all look at each other from our own perspective. Remember that word. And based on that, we judge the next person, hey, what you did is not kosher, <laughs> not right with God, right? It's not unclean. Now, brother and sister, you look at this this morning. I want you to reflect on it. I think we all had a problem, not just them. We might not have a problem with the thing we eat, we quarrel. But in light of the church in itself, everybody looking, look, the church is different. What the church is. Some think church is a social club. Some look at this church as like a big family, God's family. Now, I'm not talking about the unbelievers. This is addressing to the believers. That's why Paul said there are some weak Christians, but there are some stronger. How can we reconcile the difference? And oftentimes, you know, we want to stop right there and say, you know, we have differences, but we're not happy with you. Then I start forming opposing idea with you. Or maybe rally up some other people, go against you, your, 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 your conviction. Paul tells us not to do that because you know, don't form your own opinion over other people on things like this. Now, I will tell you something non negotiable right, before, right? With anything doctrinally unsound, or people are in sin, and we need to remind them and to bring them to back in love to bring them back in line with God's teaching and to embrace it with our love as a family member. So we're talking about here is a Christian liberty issue. What can a Christian do or not do today? Back in those days, they were talking about unclean food. But remember the Old Testament saying also they have the dietary law now, today, we're not under that law anymore. Why? Because some people are still observing. Because I, I was talking to, you know, speaking to Chinese uh, congregation earlier. Uh, I remember once somebody asked me that question, is that can we eat blood sausage? How many of you love eat blood sausage? I know, do you have a German here? <laughs> I know German people, right? You're Germans? They love eat those things. But this person, uh, you know, in our Chinese-speaking congregation, she loved that too. In fact, some Chinese eat it. It's like a jelly. You put that over and it just curl up. It's like jelly. I don't like it. I don't eat it. I think it's, to me, yeah. But I don't want to look down on them. Yeah, for those really enjoying it, have fun. Put some ketchup on it. Or maybe some, uh, you know, uh, um, hot sauce, Tabasco. Go knock yourself out. But I don't, I, I don't like it. But am I passing the judgment over to somebody that eats it? Or I'll give you an example. You know, before, somebody likes steak. I love steak. But how dare you eat steak? You're killing an animal, <laughs> right, for the anim animal activist. But we need to remember, there are so many different people make up in the church family here. Some like this, some like that. I 
how do I take a proper attitude to accept them? Now remember uh, the incidents that Paul have experienced in Acts chapter 10 when Luke wrote, Paul have this vision, right? God let him see the unclean animal, you know, come down on the four corner of a cloth on it, and the Spirit says, look, eat those animals. And Peter said, how dare you? I'm not going to eat those, God. You think, <laughs> you think I'm crazy? You know, don't tempt me. Don't tempt me. I'm not eating those animals. But three times, the Spirit talked to him and said, whatever God and make it clean, it is clean. So today, you know, I want you to look at the picture right now here. We are beyond the law of the Old Testament. Christ came, established, and fulfilled the law, right? We know that. He fulfilled the law. We're not living under the law. We're free. We have the Christian freedom, liberty to live the way that God ordained us to live. But that doesn't mean to give you the right to let go of yourself, okay, and do everything, anything that may not be glorifying God. Don't indulge yourself because you have that liberty. And that is the point I'm trying to stress. But within the confines of God's mandate, we can have freedom to do anything. And that's what God is putting a boundary over there. Christian liberty with God's grace and under that control, we can enjoy anything. We need control. Without control, that is, that is actually uh, um, abusing your freedom, right? And uh, so that's the backdrop. Then this very issue divided the church in Rome. The very same issue perhaps divided your family. There are some vegetarians, some not. Right? For mother, I, I appreciate you cooking. If you're a vegetarian home, you have to cook two, two meals. <laughs> one for a vegetarian, the other one's for me either. Uh, we, we soon, in, um, in about a month, we're going to have barbecue. I don't want to hear this issue anymore because today I just preempted it, right? I'm sure you're not. I'm just telling you, teasing you. This is not an issue. Whatever you want to eat, bring your own food here. We can share. Everything is, I quote, kosher. God bless. Everything is clean, not unclean. So we don't have the ceremony law or dietary law anymore. You know, God has ordained everything is good. So that was the issue back then. But let us remind ourselves, Paul opened up with the chapter, say, do not quarrel over opinions. And in, in the plain terms, I would just say, who cares? Who cares if that's your opinion or not? Who cares about my opinion? That's only me, what I think. But I think the important thing is that we have to remember there are some people or brothers are weaker, and that is what we have to concern of. We don't want to be the stumbling block over something that caused uh, my weaker brother to fall. Because many people are of weak spirit. And Paul is addressing to, he is not to Gentile, it's to the house of God within our congregation. There are some a weak in faith. Now, I'll describe what faith is right now already. It's your understanding of your, your religious practice, or how you related to God, what message you get it, the how you should live your life as a Christian, right? And that's your faith. That's what we're referring to. Some are weaker, means like I'm watching everything I do. God forbid, if I, I step out a little bit, I am not going to be safe. I will lose my salvation. Now, there are people who believe in that. So every time you come to church, you repent again, regain the salvation, and next thing, he step out, oops, I lost my salvation. No, the Bible said, you know, once you are saved, God put you in his hand, in his grip, you're saved. We can have that opportunity to come before God and admit our transgressions to him if we step out of the line, repent, and come back. First John 1 John 1.9, right? And God is faithful for those who admit their sin. So here is a strong brother. Who are we talking about here? The stronger brother. We would think that those will be the Jewish people, wouldn't we? But it's not. The stronger brother actually is Gentiles. 
Because the scripture actually said that you'll read it, understand that it's those that eat everything. So here the scripture is addressing the strong brother. How should they act, react to the weaker brother, which is their Jewish counterpart? And another one is that Paul also addressing to the weaker body of Christ, how do you look at the other brothers of yours that eat anything that you think is unclean? Do you ostracize them? Do you think that they are lesser of you? And Paul said, do not criticize or judge them. And what we're talking about here is a spiritual maturity, brothers and sisters. There are some spiritual, more mature people. They do understand God ordained this world is for our enjoyment. And there's a reason why at that time, in the Old Testament time, that God had commanded his chosen Israelites not to touch certain things because they are in, you know, in a foreign land with the... the um, um, the pagan people, they want to be separated. God want them to keep it clean. Right? You're not supposed to even marry a Gentile. But today, under, under Jesus' blood, we are free. We have the freedom to worship him. We have freedom to enjoy our environment. So, so we are looking today how one can be more understanding, taking that word into making us more mature instead of judging other people and condemning other people by doing or not doing. So three points I want to, to remember, very simple. I want to focus on the first four verses, right? Because later on, if I have opportunity, God allows me, I will continue on the two, two other subjects, meaning like, you know, when should we worship, should we observe Christmas? And some churches and brothers don't believe we should observe or celebrate Christmas. Right? There's a group of people like that. Are they right or wrong? But we had, we're still brothers, brothers in Christ. How can we reconcile the difference? Is drinking wine, how many wine drinker here? No wine drinker? Ah, there were a couple of them. Thank you for being uh, very, very honest. Is drinking wine allowable, or should we? Right, we're going to expound on that a little bit down the road. Should Chris, can Christian drink wine? Okay. So here are three things. S speaking to the strong brothers, which we already identified, there are the Gentiles got saved, believers. There are two groups of believers, right? The Gentiles. And Paul refer them to look at the wicked brother, which is their counterpart Jew, Jewish brothers. He said, look, you need to understand, because they're living in the past, they don't really follow what you were convicted. Christ already liberating us from it. And Paul, over and over and over, ex over and over again in his epistles, addressing the point, right? Hey, you know what, you, you, my Jewish brother, you had to let go of your traditions. Right? Because now you are new people, God's people. You should enjoy the fellowship in Christ. So, Paul saying to the stronger brothers, the Gentiles, is, look, leave them alone. Do not quarrel them. If God already accepting them, like accepting you, so what's the problem? If God doesn't see this as a problem, you see the problem? Are you God? Leave them alone. Live, live peacefully. Live in love. Because God has already accepted them. We have to look at this from church also, from our perspective. Sometimes we have weaker brothers here in church. We look at them and say, look, we criticize them, or perhaps say, Maybe it's not like me. <laughs> I'm like up there already. You look at people of lesser, lesser faith. Weaker. How do you treat that person? 
and brazen mullah because God already accepted them. You want church unity? And I think that's the first thing we need to learn. But also to the weaker brother, and I must say, and this almost, almost true, happens a lot to the weaker brothers because they don't understand they're being ignorant about certain things. And they formulate an opinion and cast a shadow over the whole entire church. My way is the only way, and you're wrong. And they can tell the leadership of the church, say, look, you're so wrong. I'm not happy with you, right? And this is the right way. Because they put on the lens, they look at things the stronger brother do because they lack of knowledge. I'll give you a reference later. So first, we need to understand God accepted the weaker brothers. Now we are looking at different scenario here, talking to, I'm sorry, uh, I mistyped it, to the weaker brother, not strong brother, point two. He's referring them to look at the stronger brothers. Don't criticize those people eating meat because you don't eat meat because you're weak. But rather, you're looking at them and say, well, maybe they got the point. And what Paul is telling us is that who are you to judge the people that my servants? Do not judge them because now to them, they have their own master, which is Lord himself. Who are you to criticize them? Servant, stand and fall based on the master's wishes. You see my point here? Don't judge them because you, you don't, you, you're, you're eating vegetarian, you're eating vegetable, only good for you. Keep going, keep doing it. But don't look at the other brother and say, hey, you criticize them by doing something different. It's because your ignorance, not understanding the truth, and you cast a shadow over and Paul used this phrase, to their masters. The servant stand or not all is the Lord, the master's problem, not yours. Leave it alone to me. But finally, I think it's very important here, we have to understand that, for we will all stand before God. Hey, you know, you're weak or strong, you, you, me. One day we're going to stand before this God, and he is the judge. He will judge you according to how you Treat your brother. Again, we're not talking about non-Christian. We're talking about all Christian here. And that's where the fundamental differences between a church can unify or not, I think. I give a lot of thought about this passage here, four verses. Why church is so many differences? Why people cannot agree on things? We can disagree, but we have to agree. Final thing is accepting one another. Right? There's only one way we can work together in uni unity. If we insist in our own conviction, there's only one way that this faith is, I think we are being naive. Because the world is not flat. The world is not flat. You understand that? I, I want to uh, draw you back to, can you turn your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 8? Let's look at verse 7 to 11. 1 Corinthians. This is what God says right here. Uh, Jethro, can I ask, uh, perhaps uh, can you read aloud, aloud for us, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 8, from 7 to 11. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some through former association with idols eat food as being offered to an idol, and their conscience can be used to defile. Food will not, be com will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. So take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so
so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Um, okay, thank you. And through, verse 11, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. Weak brother knowledge. What can we do here to change, shift the dynamic? I think we, we, have, we can do something about this. It's put Elevating that we can help the brother, uh, uh, weaker brother to mature in the spirit. With the humility, humble heart, not judging other people first. Look at ourselves. Are we doing the same thing as those weaker brothers? If we're not, then we have the right to remind them, to judge them. Now, this is very different than Matthew. Seven, when Jesus said, "Do not judge, or else you'll be judged." Do not measure people, other people, by your own measure. Right? What Jesus is saying is to those uh, hypocrites. That paragraph. The Pharisees. In this context, Paul said, "Do not judge." Is different. He's addressing to brothers in Christ. It's two different groups of people, two different dynamics. So do not use this passage and tell other people, do not judge me. Or use the other passage, you know, put it in here because there's different context. We do not judge other people by our own opinion. It's because you both are right. Listen, you're both right. You have the right to eat meat, but also you have the right to eat vegetable. Now, with that said, we can coexist. We can respect one another because there's no difference between man and woman, right? Gentile and Jew, you know, Paul said that very clear to us in Christ we're only one type of people. It's not two types. It's no and clean, clean people. It's no vegetarian or meat people. Is only one type. Do whatever you like in glorifying God. That's good. That is the principle right here. So let me give you some, you know, a real application here. Since we are in this passage here in uh, Corinthians 8, can we eat food offered to idol? Can we eat food that offered to idol? Come on, people. Yes, right? By principle, we just talk about you can eat food offered to idols. But the principle is if you cause the weaker brother to stumble, I'd rather not eat for my life. Period. I'm not going to touch it because her faith. Can you? So there's no longer a struggle right here. I remember uh, back um, in early 1900s, maybe perhaps 1800s, when the um, Western um, missionaries come to China, right? They, they want to share the gospel with Chinese. And one thing they're very against is Chinese people offering by Zhou Xin Yimengang. Worship and ancestors. Okay? And they really don't understand. Maybe, maybe perhaps the terminology here and that we're talking about is that even Christian, Christians should not be worshiping ancestors. I do agree not to worship anybody other than God, but however, is they put your emphasis, understand the culture, the context here. You go there, we still do, you know, going to cemetery, offering flowers or things like that to our loved one that precede us. Right? And they shouldn't put the framework on condemning certain people, the group of people practicing that, by not understanding where they're coming from. This is the very same thing as the Jewish people over there. They're eating and clean. Uh, they're not eating the clean thing. And that's causing a lot of people to stumble. They're not... They, they, they're, they're trying to accept 
Jesus, but yet become a stumbling block for them not to accept Jesus as their Savior. Now, we are not here to advocate worshiping ancestor, but rather we're paying respect by offering you know, uh, uh, a gesture, you know, flowers or something to answers. Even, you know, bowing your head is not worshiping. Okay, that's okay. Kokong, right? In Kongdongwa, it's okay. But you see, because the Western culture and the Chinese culture is quite different. And then, sadly, sometimes we need to understand, give each other the preference. Also, in Romans, they're talking about the same thing. If I go to India, if I go to Philippines, right, and everybody practices religions a little differently, even Christianity. Our brothers in Africa, the way they worship, I don't think we'll do it here. You have them dancing all over the floor here and yelling hallelujah, blah, blah, blah. blah. You know, they're not wrong. We're all worshiping God, but it's manifesting in different ways. Amen? I, I, I tell you, one day in heaven, we're going to find out the truth. Everybody, all nations, all tongues that come together. This is Bible Revelation is very beautiful. All tongues. I don't care what you do, what you sing. We all come worshiping God in His presence here. You're eating meat, you're not eating meat. We all come worshiping Him, supping with the Lamb. I don't know what feast is up there. I think there will be no vegetable, no meat, but God's presence is not for me. So what are you fighting over? Who are you to judge your brother here? So one to close it up here with some thoughts. There are some questions. People say, well, Christians shouldn't dance. Christians shouldn't go into a theater to watch movies. Now, I know the older folks may have the condemnation, right? Younger folks doesn't know what I'm talking about. When I grow up, the pastors telling us, well, you go to theater is bad. Yeah, well, Hong Kong, you may be too young. <laughs> it just shows my age. You know what the pastor said? When you go into a theater because it's so dark inside, no light, and people do something very shady, <laughs> that's, that's the basis. But how do you know? How can you condemn somebody going to theater and to watch a nice movie because what you think, your perception of theater is people committed some un- immoral things? Dancing. Back in those good old days again, people said, well, you shouldn't go to dance because dance, they only associate that with people that are not so good people. They sell drugs and they, you know, have immoral, uh, immorality, things are happening there. But in, in a sense, dancing is rejoicing. We all dance, Christians, dancing before our Lord, singing hallelujah. But is how do you see it is clean and clean? If God says clean, it's clean. Give you another thing here. I know some people have tattoos and somebody loves the tattoo. I don't. But should you, uh, you know, despise people with the tattoo in, in, in the body? I don't condone them, but I'm not against them. That's the Christian liberty you're talking about here. How do you associate, you know, somebody associated with tattoo with something? It's because the gangsters also have t- tattoo too. So you shouldn't do that. Or maybe sometimes there's certain logic to it because you don't want to confuse yourself with those bad guys, right? But in, a se- in essence, it itself is Christian liberty. You don't do it, it's fine. But other people do it. we all brothers and sisters in Christ. We embrace each other in love. And to give each other room and preference instead of judging them. Amen? So can a Christian do this? You go think about this. You can start dotting a lot of issues here. We're fighting for what is only your opinion. Who cares? But yet we make it so big as like a mountain, now the molehill. But once we have problem in the church here, because I said the uh, mid-autumn festival, we, our church have few times that we celebrate those events, we bring mooncake here, we share, we share testimony, but there's to certain people that's ungodly. They're very unhappy with it. They come up to me and say, Pastor, how can the church celebrating such a pagan holiday? I don't know how to answer them. I know the answer, but I don't know how to tell them. 
But I just use the scripture says, okay, what? If you think, I'm not going to argue with you. That's your opinion. I don't need to convince you. See, this is a godly, godly holiday. But if God ordained the moon up there and shine upon us with a full moon to remembering him, like the psalmist says in Psalm 19, praise him. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 8, I think, right? Praise him. God creating this moon for us. So you can look at from the spiritual perspective and make everything beautiful because God is beautiful. So let's take a home one step. I want you to know, young people, older folks, or mature, we need to mature in Jesus Christ. Look at what God creating everything. God make it clean. We accepted it. And we embrace one another with genuine love. Because he is Lord and he is love. God is in it. Secondly, we need to help the weaker brothers to understand the Christian liberty is founded in based on who Jesus Christ is. He came, put himself on the cross, shedding his blood for me so that I am no longer under the damnation of the law because I cannot keep the law. He liberated me. That's why I'm free. I had to give God the honor and glory, but I need also to share my, my brother's my weaker counterpart said, look, do you understand what Christ did for us? Today, I can live peacefully, enjoying everything that he had for me. I wish you can understand to enjoy it too. But yet, I don't want to be a stumbling block. If I cause you to stumble, please forgive me. Because I drink a wine. I drink, you know, I drink a wine. I won't do it if you don't do it. I think we need to help them to understand. That's called love. That's called give them, them the preference instead of my preference. It's not important. I want, to, I want to emphasize, I don't want to impose my preference on my brother, any one of you, it's because I love it or because I hate certain things. You have to understand, we have to help each other to grow and to lift who Christ is. Lastly, remember one thing. Whatever you do, we do, I do. One day, God is going to judge us. And I better do the right thing. Amen? I better be right with God and right with myself. Never mind about other people. I do it right by God, and everything else will be right because God already accepted all of us and like his. So let's pray. Father, thank you for this little time that we have together, the little four verses. Once again, you're reminding us that you're liberating us. We shouldn't judge another people based on our own opinion or any this trouble, you know, stuff that, that we think is important to me that's no longer important. Rather, it's your salvation, your love on the cross is the utmost important. That's something that we never compromise. And Satan wants us to put loops around, tie us down so, so tight, we forgot that who you are. We are a family. We are brothers and sisters in the blood of Jesus so that we can live peacefully with diversity, with love, as long as God is center. We're doing things that pleasing you and honoring you and lifting you up because you are holy and you are righteous. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.